Okay, good morning. It's Friday morning. It's February the, what is today, the 5th? Today is February the 5th. Today is my daughter-in-law's birthday. I'm super excited for that. Uh, Katrin Vila Lowry. Um, she, I, I'm not sure how old she is. She's uh, either 38 or 39. I'm not sure. I think 38 today. And she is the mother of my sweet grandson, Oscar and uh, the stepmother to my sweet granddaughter, Alistair. So happy birthday to you. She's just um, the joy of our lives. She's so precious, so sweet, such a good person. All right, let me just tell you. Last night, I had this great idea for something to do today. And uh, I studied and prepared for it. I felt really good about it. And then I woke up this morning and immediately, 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 I can't snap my fingers anymore, but imagine snapping happening. Isaiah 53. I mean, I woke up this morning and it was like Steve said, Isaiah 53. Only he didn't. He didn't. He was still sound asleep. Isaiah 53. So turn there in your Bible. Isaiah 53. I'm super excited. I've been, uh, I've been reading Isaiah 53. I just want to touch, and I mean touch, on the fact that yesterday so many of you sent such great uh, uh, thoughts and, and uh, your own understanding of Matthew. And uh, wow, it was really, really good. So I think, I think for now we are going to, Put that to rest and we're going to be happy with it except that now steve is all about the vultures and the eagles and he's been studying it and been talking about it and uh so okay so matthew i mean isaiah 53 turn to isaiah 53 and, and we're just amazingly enough we're just going to sit there for a little while um all right father I thank you for speaking to us. I thank you for revelation. I thank you, Father, for reminding us time and time and time again who we are and who you are. I thank you, Lord, that I am a child of God. In Christ's name, amen, amen, amen. All right, we've been talking about uh, this week, second coming. And we've been talking about the rapture. And we've been talking about the vultures and the eagles. And um, so today, I want you to turn in your Bible to Isaiah 53. You know, I'm going to tell you something. That sometimes when when you look at Isaiah 53 and you're, you're talking about um, uh, this prophecy, it's like mind blowing that Jesus is so clearly spoken of way back in Isaiah. I mean, this this show you shows you that Isaiah was a true prophet of God. Let, let me tell you something about prophets. If somebody claims to be a prophet and then nothing they say happens, well, that then they're a false prophet. I, I don't care how many years you've known them or or how good their mama was. Uh, if they are always saying stuff and it never comes to pass, well, then they're false prophets. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. And you need that this morning with your coffee is you need a little bit of truth. All right, so Isaiah 53, it starts with, uh, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who has received this? We're receiving this message. And when it talks about the arm of the Lord will be revealed, because the rest of this chapter seems like when you, the first time you read it through, or, you know, if you read it through and you're not really taking it apart, well, then it says, uh, who's believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, here's, here's what's happening. Because when we think of the arm of the Lord, what do we think of? We think of strength. We think of his will. We think of his power. 
we think of his majesty. And so now we're going to be reading this chapter, and it's like, I, how is there strength? How is there majesty? And it's because I want us to keep this in our mind the whole time we're reading this. It's his will. It's his will. And when something is his will, he puts his strength to it. He puts his majesty to it. Sally and I were talking yesterday, at great length, by the way. Sally and I were talking yesterday about how is it that sometimes a scripture is so confusing, so confusing, and so confusing. And we agreed, and this is Sally's, this is Sally, Sally's revelation, so I'm just sending that on to you. We agreed that because sometimes... It's just not the right timing for under, us to understand it or to know it. Maybe us as a nation to understand it or to know it. Maybe us as a people to understanding it or to know it. And sometimes as an individual, it's not yet time for us to have the understanding of it. We can know it. We can study it. And I think God pours into us. But then there are times when you're just like, Mind blown. I love that little emoji. It's like mind being blown. Because sometimes you read something and you read something and you read something and it's like, okay, I think this means that, but I'm just not sure. And then you read it that 55,000th time and it's like, oh, that's what that means. That's got to be what that means. And he grew up before him like a tender shoot. So when we think of a tender shoot, I want all of you to think back to uh, back to when it was warm and we were all watching plants come up out of the ground. And, and think about that when that first starts happening. Because it's February now, but in a month, so in March, uh, but maybe, a, maybe even a little bit, earlier if you know if it gets warm out in my front yard <coughs> there are some um there's some beautiful little flowers some tulips and and they're going to come up and when they first come up you can barely see them you can barely see them because they're tender now here's the funny thing about that they can come when it's still very cold outside. And when there's snow on the ground, sometimes you can look out here in Maryland, you can look out and you can say, oh, look, look at that. They're, they're very tender, but their roots go deep because I never planted those plants. And the man who lived here before us, he and his wife had been divorced for a little while. And so, I'm thinking the wife planted those plants, and this fall, I've been in this house 18 years. And I can tell you for a fact that over the 18 years I've lived here, every spring, even though I think every year, there's no way they survived me running over that area with the boat uh, in the trailer. I wasn't actually on the boat when I ran over it, but... Uh, I ran I ran over it with the trailers and and we backed back and forth over it. People have parked on that area. And I will say, I just I wonder if they'll be able to come out this year because they're so fragile. But they come every year and they're beautiful. Because in their season, it happens. So as a root out of dry ground. So they're tender and as a root out of dry ground. Now, think of the driest place you can possibly think of and then think of it being drier than that. And that's where Jesus sprang from because it was God's will. It was God's plan. He started as a tender root, a baby, a baby. So tender, so young, so little, against all the circumstances. And he continued to grow, and it was like he was a root out of dry ground. 
I think there are so many times where his word is a root out of dry ground. I don't know how you have felt over the last year, but I have felt like this has been a root out of dry ground because it is Jesus. When we are in a dry and we're in a barren and we're in a desert place, he plants that seed within us, this seed within us, and it grows and it continues to prosper. And, and let me just tell you, uh, let me tell you something that I really hadn't intended to tell anybody, but I'm, I'm going to say this. Always in the past, even though I've been a teacher my whole life, my whole life, Daddy built us a playhouse when we were little girls. I'm the oldest, by far the oldest. And I turned that playhouse into a schoolhouse. And my two sisters were, were learning out of the uh, Ruby Falls brochures and Rock City brochures, anything I could lay my hands on. When I started getting uh, Nancy Drew books, uh, we studied Nancy Drew books. I've been a teacher my whole life. Thank you, Sally and Sherry, for enduring that. Might be why they both kind of were like, oh, we don't want to go to school. Because they've been in school their whole life. But when Steve would say, I, I'm going to need you to preach, I would say, here was my response. I have to have two weeks to study. I have to have two weeks to study, Steve, because otherwise I, I can't do it. And he's always honored that. And last Sunday, on Saturday night, Steve got sick and wasn't feeling well at all. Saturday night, he stays up all night and he studies and he prays and he gets ready, but he just did not feel well at all. And so I stepped into his office and I said, what's going on? And he explained that to me. And I said, do you want me to preach in the morning? I mean, before I even had time to think about it. And he said, well, I don't want to put that much pressure on you. And I said, you know what? I'm good. I'm, I, I can be ready. So I, I stayed up late Saturday night. I got up early Sunday morning. And I felt really good about how God is bringing me out of a dry place and filling me up so spiritually that I am, for the first time in my life, instant in season and out of season. You see what God can do in our dry and our desert areas? He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. I'm in Isaiah 50. Oh, Kelly says her daffodils are coming up now. Oh, and crocus. Okay, so now I'm going to, so now I'm going to go out and look at my yard. But there's snow on the ground, so we'll take a minute. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Now, let me tell you, that doesn't mean he was ugly. That just means he wasn't Brad Pitt. He wasn't Tom Cruise. He wasn't Denzel Washington. I saw a Denzel Washington movie last night for a minute back in 1981, and it was amazing. What a good-looking man. He's always been Denzel Washington. Good-looking man. But it says he was despised and he was rejected. Rejected, that word there is uh, C-H-A-D-E-L. I don't remember how to pronounce it. Chadel, which means vacant. They just, they had no, nothing about him. Uh, you know, there are some times when people meet me for the 50th time and I still have to be introduced to them because evidently there was nothing about me that they regarded as, oh, I need to file that name away and remember it. You know that happens to everybody except Brad Pitt and Denzel Washington. He was despised. He was rejected. Sometimes we think if somebody unfriends us, that we're despised and rejected, suffering for Jesus. When the truth is, sometimes they accidentally did it. 
Sometimes I accidentally did it. If I have unfriended you, I can guarantee you, unless you were posting bad stuff on your page, I accidentally did it. If you were posting bad stuff, I did it. But I told you I did it. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. I think sometimes we look at other people's lives and we think they don't even know what going through something like this would feel like. Jesus knew all of the things that we would go through. He, he knew sorrow. He knew our sorrow. He knew the suffering that we would go through. He knew the sorrows and the sufferings of his friends. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't think it mattered to Jesus that he was despised and rejected. I don't. But the fact that we would be despised and rejected because of him, that's the sorrow, that's the suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Have you ever seen somebody and or had somebody on you see somebody on television and you cannot wait to turn the channel and you just turn your face from that and you think that's not important in my life why am I, why am I watching this why am I listening to this or why is this happening Aline Robinson let me just tell you that card you sent me yesterday the bomb <clears throat> I had it I've got it downstairs on the kitchen so I just want you to know that I thank you for that. Beautiful. It's a little red truck full of Valentine's. Beautiful. But he knew, sorry about that little thing, but I saw her name. He knew the sorrow and the suffering that we would go through. He knew the rejection we would go through. And for that, he was sorrowful. He despised, he was despised and said, we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. So whatever our infirmities are today, whatever our sorrows are today, we can think about this. God took that. He knew about that. He knew that was going to happen. Nowhere in God's word, and hear me on this and understand what I'm saying. Nowhere in God's word does it say once you become a Christian, you no longer will have any sorrows. You won't have any suffering. Things will always be beautiful and sunny and bright in your life. And I'm going to tell you, there is nowhere in God's word where it promises that. We will go through trials. We will go through tribulations. But we won't go through those things alone. And God is not unaware of our sorrows and our suffering. He knew about it. He knew about our infirmities. I, I said to Sally and Sherry one day when I was feeling really sorry for myself, we were all together doing something. I don't remember what it was. And I was really having a little pity party because I had to have my knee replaced. I don't think I yet had my hip replaced, but I, I don't remember. Maybe I had. And I said to Sally and Sherry, because our mother had terrible arthritis, and I've said to them a hundred times, I hope I was, I hope I was, um, I hope I was sympathetic. I hope I was kind to my mother when she had such bad arthritis. I hope I was. I think I was. I hope I was. And then I said, I, I wonder what mom would say if she knew that I was in the same boat that she traveled in for so many years. And they said mom would be brokenhearted. I, I don't think mother knows I have arthritis because I didn't have arthritis like this when mother died. But Jesus knows. But Jesus knows. Because he is aware of our infirmities. He himself bore our sickness and our sorrow so he knows about it veronica the situation that you went through with your leg he knew about it he knew about it he was aware of it 
Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. How many times have you heard people say, well, if, if God killed his own son, how can, I, how can I believe he would help me if God killed his own son? There are ministers, and, and they're not ministers of the Christian faith, in my opinion, and I'm right about this, who say that if God is a God who would strike and allow his own child to be crucified, that's not even true. He never did that because he's not that kind of God. He is that kind of God. And let me tell you why. Because he was pierced for our transgressions and he was bruised and crushed for our iniquities. Not for his. This was God's plan all along. That he would send a Savior into the world. And that Savior would be Jesus Christ. And that Savior would be his own son. And that Savior would die on the cross. And then he would rise again. It says, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. What? What a powerful sentence. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. I think I could explain that to my three-year-old grandson, and he would understand that. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. The punishment that we should have borne was on him. And that's how we get peace. That's the only way we can have hope, is to believe that as he died on that cross, and he died, he didn't swoon. It wasn't some uh, conspiracy theory thing. He died on that cross. He was bruised. He was crushed. He was pierced. He was wounded. But it was a plan that he would do those things for us. We all, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Now, there's a couple of references to sheep in this. Because let me tell you something about sheep. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. There's a, there's a, a little farm uh, not too far from us, right here in the middle of Fort Washington. It's hilarious, and it's got llama and all of this stuff, but there's sheep there, and as Oscar calls them, sheeps. <clears throat> and he'll say, Nanny, did you, say the, did you see the sheeps today? And I'll say yes. And I know I should correct him, but I love it that he says sheeps. And so uh, it doesn't matter that, you know, I teach grammar. I'm going to let that child say sheeps. I love it. Here's what happens to those sheeps. If one of them gets distracted from the eating, because they just have their heads down eating, all day. What a life. They've got those glorious fur coats on and they've got their heads down and they're eating. And if one of them gets distracted and starts going that way, even if he's heading towards a cliff, all of those sheep, they follow him. They don't even raise up their heads. They just follow him. As the principal of a school, as, the, as a teacher, as the mother of four children, I have said more times in my life than I even want to think about, well, if they got up on the roof and jumped off, would you? Because the first thing out of a kid's mouth is, well, they were doing that. Other people were doing that. Everybody does that. And then we follow that leader right off the cliff. All we like sheep, we've gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. His own way. 
He's the only way. You know, we're we're out somewhere, and um, and let me just tell you, Steve has the most keen sense of direction of anybody I've ever known, and he will instinctively know no, this isn't right. You know, we're we're going in the wrong direction. And I cannot tell you how it thrills my soul to be driving. I'm driving, and Steve is saying, no, you need to go this way. And I will say, no, I know where I'm going on this. I've been there before. And I can get us there. I don't have to put it in the GPS. I can get us there. And Steve will say, oh, I didn't even know you could come this way to this place. Now, in the back of his head, he's probably saying, I still would have gone the other way. But he gives me the benefit of the doubt. You see, we want to go our own way. We think we have this plan, and we think it's perfect, uh, perfect, and we say, I'm just going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to keep doing this, and maybe I'll get some other sheeps to follow me, and I'm going to do this until I fall off the cliff. Because we like sheep, we've gone our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God knew that we were going to be those sheep. That we were going to want to go in every direction. That we would have sin in our lives. Because it had already entered in. And he knew we would want to go our own way. But he said, no, I'm going to give you Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you this anchor but because I know what you're like that was part of his punishment because the punishment for our peace was laid upon him now it's not that the guards piercing him caused that the punishment was laid upon him Hear me. He was not killed by the Roman soldiers for our punishment. Our punishment for our peace was laid upon him. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth except to honor God. God, Jesus never said Please, guys, please, guys, don't, don't do this. Please, guys, please, guys, don't do this. He wasn't like a dumb sheep led to the slaughter. That's not what that means. He was silent. He was silent. Except to honor his father. To honor God. If we open our mouth to complain, if we open our mouth to say anything, it should be to honor God. It should be to honor God. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers, silent. All of that was taken off. All his dignity, all of his majesty, brought down to its bare basic point. And so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and by judgment, he was taken away, or by his arrest, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? He had no children. He had no family. There was no one there calling out, oh, this is my dad. His mother and his brothers were there, his sisters, but he had no descendants. We were the children that he would leave behind, for he was cut off from the land of the living. This is when that division happened, cut off from the land of the living. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. You know, their plan was to crucify him like a thief, I mean, that's the crucifixion was reserved for hardened, terrible criminals, murderers. Then he was to be thrown into the graves that they had for the criminals and for the wicked. That was the plan, to be thrown in with the wicked. But it says, but he was rich, but with the rich in his death. 
a rich man came forward. A rich man with not a pit dug down in the ground, but with a beautiful burial site in a cave, in a gorgeous setting. Those of you who have been there, those of you who have been there with us, it's and I'll, sh I'll show you the pictures tomorrow. I should have thought about that. But it's a, it's a beautiful garden. It's the garden where he prayed. And there stands in that area a tomb. And it's hewn out of rock. It's a beautiful setting. It's not the garbage dump. It's not the dump outside the city limits. It's a beautiful, beautiful place where rich people we're buried. We're rich people were buried. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Now let me tell you something about Jesus going silently. He was silent, but he was not helpless. He could have said at any minute, I've changed my mind. I don't want to do this. I just can't go through with it. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. I've always questioned that. I've always thought, how is that right? That it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Let me just give you this. Because this death was planned and it was ordained, and it was God's victory. It was God's victory, not Satan's victory. It was not. Satan, I'm sure, thought it was a huge victory for Team Satan. Imagine the Super Bowl that's coming up. If the other team were to take out Tom Brady. I don't mean kill him, but take out Tom Brady. They would think that was a huge victory. But what if Tom Brady's team were to say to the public, we're going to remove Tom Brady because we have a plan. This was God's plan. It was his victory. And through the Lord makes his life a guilt offering. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the Lord and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. God's will will prosper in the hands of Jesus Christ because he was given up as an offering, because he allowed this plan to happen, because he allowed to go. To, it says, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of his life, and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion of the great. A portion of the great. Uh, let's see. My Bible, down in the little notes, it says, um, just in the notes, or he will see the results and be satisfied. That's good. That's really good. He will see, oh, therefore he will see, or numerous. He will see and divide the spoils with the strong. So he's going to see the multitudes and divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death. He poured it out. He just... Allowed it to happen. It, it, and notice it doesn't say because he was murdered. Because he was murdered. It says because he poured out his life. He wasn't murdered. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. I mean the thieves on either side. That's who he died with, a thief on either side. 
the Son of God died with transgressors. The crowd was calling out, give us Jesus. I mean, we, we just want to crucify him. We want to crucify him. Now, just days before, they were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, we worship you. We're throwing down palms before you. We worship you. And just a couple of days later, they're like, kill him. Kill him. Crucify him. He was among the transgressors, but because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That happened that day. While he was on the cross, he was interceding for the, for the thief who said, forgive me. For the thief who said, I, I, I'm so sorry. For the thief, he was, while he was dying, he was interceding. This day you will be with me in glory. This day you will be with me in glory. Now, that thief didn't go to Sunday school his whole life, or, or he wasn't the, uh, the son of a minister, and, or maybe he wasn't the top guy in the witnessing team. He was a thief, and he didn't know anything about Jesus Christ, and he hadn't followed him, and he didn't believe in him, and he was falling, but he realized when he saw him, this is the Son of God. The guards who were down at his feet gambling for his clothes. Gambling for his clothes. I said, this, this was the Son of God. What have we done? Can you imagine that day? The horror. That would have been what they knew was, what have we done? What have we done? We didn't believe. We didn't trust him. We didn't respect him. We rejected him. We despised him. And now we're standing at his feet and we're realizing what have we done? What have we done? Today, Isaiah 53 has completely, I don't know, blown my mind. Mind-blowing. Life-changing. Studying God's Word with you for the past year has been, for me, mind-blowing. Instead of me saying 15 years from now, what on earth did I accomplish in 2020? I, I know. In 2020, God opened my eyes. And in 2021, should he tarry by December, I can't imagine. I can't imagine what else he's going to reveal to us. Listen, just that little sentence yesterday. Mind-blowing. And I know I'm saying that a lot today, but... Sally's eating a pop tart, and I'm kind of jealous, and maybe I'm a, got a little sugar high. But I'm going to tell you something. That just that little snippet yesterday, and all that it brought into my mind and into your minds. And Sally called me yesterday, and um, and and uh, I was over at the church, and and uh, she was like, "Call me as soon as you get as soon as you get out of your car." And, and we were talking and talking and talking and talking. And then I finally had to say, okay, I'm home. I need to feed Steve lunch or I need to fix our lunch. I don't know what I said. <clears throat> I didn't say I'm going to need to feed Steve lunch. But I said, <laughs> well, I got to go and fix lunch. And then Steve and I got in the car last night. We, we drove down to Waldorf. And that's all we talked about all the way down there and all the way back. The only other thing we discussed was what do you want for dinner? I'm going to tell you something. God's Word. God's Word is so alive and it's so real. And what a time for revelation we're having. What a time for revelation. I'm going to go. I know I'm late. Let me see what time is it. Oh, yeah, I'm late.
I love you guys so much. I love you guys so much. I am so enjoying having this Bible study time with you. I'm loving you. I'm loving it. You know, there's a little bit of pressure. Well, there's actually quite a bit of pressure. Every day to know that when I sit down here in this chair, when I'm ever back downstairs in my kitchen, which, by the way, who knows. But when I'm sitting in this chair and when I tap that button, I know I have to have a word from God for you. I respect your time. I respect your time. And I love you so much. God bless you, Becky. We are praying for Ray. We are believing in a total, total miracle in Ray's life. Those of you who have asked for prayer, some have asked that I keep it private. And I absolutely will. Let me just tell you, God loves you so much that he died for your sins. Father, give us the strength we need today. Put a blessing on our lives today. Hold us in your hand today. Father, we thank you for taking our sin and taking our iniquity on you. For dying and taking the punishment that we would have peace. In Christ's name, amen, amen, amen. Tonight, we're going to have Friday night prayer. It's going to be in the sanctuary. It's going to be awesome. Um, and then tomorrow morning, we have Bible study at 10 o'clock. We will be taking communion tomorrow morning. We will be taking communion tonight uh, at, the, at the prayer meeting. And then Sunday morning, I cannot wait. I cannot, I cannot wait. All right. God bless you. I love you so much. Bye-bye.